and for those who like me don't hear very well. Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, the Dynatrace Lab. But, um, uh, we are gonna be uh, talking about the uh, completable future and its quirks and the future of Hasselcast. Uh, this um, um, uh, meetup is going to be conducted by my colleague Nacho and Gregor. <laughs> <That's>, sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, so in terms of uh, the lab, just for you to know where you are, I think it's nice to see, to, to know where you are. Uh, this is the Dynatrace lab. Uh, this is part of the 11 labs we have at Dynatrace. Uh, this is uh, the third one in terms of size. We have uh, Linz, where we have the head headquarters. Linz, Linz is in, in Austria, by the way, uh, for those who no, don't know it. Uh, then the second biggest one is in Poland, where uh, Greg, Gregor is coming from. Greg, yeah, he's a bit thank, thank you very much. And we have uh, here, uh, we developed several solutions. Uh, we, this is the uh, home solution for digital experience. It's one of our solutions. I don't know if you are aware uh, of what we do. We do observability. We're an, an observability uh, company. And within this uh, scope, what we do is basically digital experience here. So how to uh, monitor or how to observe uh, the UI and then uh, being able to uh, record and replay sessions, user sessions, and then all the way down into the last piece of infrastructure. We also uh, do a big chunk of the UI of um, the dashboarding, the design system in the front end, and uh, some other pieces like uh, log monitoring now with the big launch of Grail, which is our, uh, how is it called? Uh, Lake house uh, for, so it's uh, ingesting, hi, welcome. Ingesting uh, massive uh, amounts of uh, data and processing huge amounts of data with uh, parallel processing. I don't want to go too much farther than this. Um, Nacho, please. Um, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I work like a duck, but it's because I've been running today. So, hey, hello. Really nice people there. Thank you for coming, all of you. Uh, seems to be like a rock star, but this is for the recording, you know. Um, so, how many of you have been uh, on uh, any Barcelona Java user group for a long time? I think I met a few familiar faces, but how many of you <coughs> came? We say another way. How many of you came for the first time to any Barcelona Java user group? Hey, don't lie to me. Come on, you already are one of the famous people that are coming here. So, how many people are just coming for the first time? You, two, so two people. Okay. And you? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay, so I'm going to explain a little bit what is this all about and, and the inter typical introduction. I know everybody probably knows much better than me, probably the community, but I have to do this more introduction because of those two persons. So welcome, first of all, welcome to to the Java User Group. This is a nonprofit and also a, an interesting group where everybody is welcome, and we always try to organize events related to Java, but not only with Java. And probably, uh, well, I would say that we are techies, let's say, or geeks or nerds. I don't know, depending on how you how you uh, identify yourself. And also, we are a nonprofit organization, which is, is really cool because with that approach, we can organize events for other reasons. And we are always dis always open to discuss and to learn and to practice on different different technologies. Um, so what we do, we do things like that. We discuss around technology. We meet ourselves. We have everything that we can actually do for growing in terms of helping the community and un understanding anything or practicing whatever technology or sharing whatever talk that you might like. Please reach to us if you want to, I don't know, uh, talk about a particular thing or learn about any particular thing that you don't know, because we can actually, uh, you know, grab somebody or ping somebody who can actually be the expert on that area. And then we can actually try to figure it out if we have somebody who can actually come to the uh, Java community and, and do a talk related with that. Who knows? And probably many of you, at least for the newcomers, they arrive via Meetup, right? Majority of the people are coming via Meetup. But we have also different channels where people can actually ping us via Twitter, via 
Facebook, we are, I don't remember, Flickr, YouTube. We have also many videos recorded there. And I think we have also LinkedIn, by the way, if you want to connect there. We have also a group where people actually are sharing job offers, etc. So you are really welcome to join us. And yes, we have done, if you check the meetup, we will, you will see that we have done, I don't know how many events, but the, the, the average is 1.5 or two events per month, which is really cool for, uh, you know, doing everything for free. Oh, so yeah, we have already our next event already planned it's in two weeks, if I'm not wrong. Then it's going to be talking about domain driven design applied to organizations and also why related with hexagonal. Something really interesting because we will have also two speakers and it will happen with, uh, with the Revolut people. If I'm not wrong, Revolut, they are creating kind of a meetup and there we will actually collaborate with them. What else? So yes, I have to say thank you, by the way, all the people read the with analysis who made this possible. By the way, I forget to explain you. I'm terrible sorry about that. We have the toilets already there for any particular emergency. Uh, the, the, the doors, the emergency doors, I think they are, you have it there. You have the fridge there. Uh, you, if you would like to drink any water, if you have anything, you, you would like coffee or you would like to eat something, you have also drinks there. Please just grab it as 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 soon as you want and be comfortable here. Just if you want to go in that direction in the office, just please let us know first, because then we will have somebody from Dynatis will actually come with you just to have a look that, you know, things are gonna working as expected. And also we have JetBrains with us uh, that they are gonna give us some licenses. If somebody was like an IntelliJ license, please raise your hand later on or came to us and say, hey, I would like to an IntelliJ license. We have some IntelliJ license that is one year, if I'm not wrong, one year uh, license, which is cool and it's free. So. Um, yeah, so probably many of you know uh, that we are actually an open group and all of these things, but I also explain you. If you have any crazy idea, please let us know, send us a message. Uh, I have this idea of this problem in, in, our, in our company, how we can, I don't know, introduce some technology, we can play with it or something. And also we have the Slack channel. Somebody from time to time, people are asking, hey, I have a question related with that framework. Stack Overflow is one option. Another option is go to the community and say, hey, this is something that I'm where we are doing. Is this something that you are used to it or, well, just ping us. It is something really, really um, easy to make. And yeah, uh, nothing more. I don't want to steal you more time, uh, Gregor. Thank you for coming one more time. So Gregor is a lead architect at Hasselcast and is a world famous, let's say, speaker. And also, yeah, one of our friends, let's say. Thank you, Gregor, for coming. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, actually, it's been a couple of years. I mean, I've been on JBCN recently, but last time I was here was a long time ago. Hello over there. Um, so uh, today I presented, I have two things for you. Um, since I'm a lead architect at Hazelcast, it means probably some of you assume that I code mostly in PowerPoint and you're probably right. So during the, the first session, I will give you some insights about what's happening with the product because it's quite exciting, especially given the fact that when people hear Hazelcast, the most quite the most common reaction is, oh, so it's like Redis, but Java. Well, yes, but actually no. Um, so this is quite exciting stuff happening in the product itself. But in the second part, I will try to go hands-on and show you quite an interesting, quite some interesting things about Comptable Future. Um, I'll try to live code, but I'm an architect, so that might not work out. So, but but we'll see. Um, so, um, Hazelcast started. Hazelcast journey started a long time ago. Um, actually, the first lines of code were um, put on GitHub. Or maybe it wasn't GitHub even in 2008. Um, the original founder was was a was a Turkish guy living in the US. Um, so one of the first offices became one in, in Turkey. And it indeed started as a caching solution mostly for Java. So it was running in embedded mode, Java friendly, um, super easy to configure. And I even re recall myself going to one of the conferences a long time ago, like 10, 12 years ago, when I was still a student and there was a Hazelcast booth, someone grabbed me and were like, Hey, do you want a t-shirt? Let me just show you something in five minutes. And at that time, I was uh, I was a student, uh, so a trade, you know, a trade. Five minutes of my time for a t-shirt seemed like a like a pretty good deal. So I went for it, and it worked like a charm. So the guy showed me 
um, created an IMAP, a few instances of that, and hey, that thing clustered and formed the cluster pretty much automatically. That was a magic. Uh, but since that time, quite a lot have happened. We no longer position ourselves as a cache, but something more. And this is pretty much what this talk is about. So um, during during the years, we transitioned from a cache into something that was so-called IMDG. So it an operational, even more computing platform, which sounds well pretty serious if you consider it a cache. We became polyglot. We started accepting, um, we started doing way more things than just supporting simple puts and gets. Um, and IMDG actually stands for for things. Uh, it means in memory data grid, in memory data and grid. Um, when you mean when you say in memory, usually you underline that there is no persistence. And usually when you say in memory, you also underline the fact that the late the access of latency when it comes to data stored in memory usually is orders of magnitude better than when if you go to the hard drive. So when someone says in memory, they want to stress that this thing is fast. But the, there's another problem. Um, so if it's that fast, why don't you replace our hard disk drives with RAM? Because it's not that easy. It's, it's way more expensive and it's way harder to get terabytes of data into RAM than onto the hard drive. But when you, create, when you can create clusters, naturally you can store way more memory that can be processed um, right in memory, which means fast. So when you, when, you, when you underline data, that usually means that two things. So storage is the obvious thing because you want to store things. Uh, but the none of this thing is that you can run computations on top of that. So once you have your data in a cache, now well, what is the best place where you would like those computations to be run? So if you have a map which implements, let's say, Java interfaces, um, if you want to process all of that, you might you know, get your map, go forage, iterate through the whole map, uh, apply some transformations, save it back, and it will probably work on a on a test. It will work in a uh, during a short conference talk. But if your cluster has fifty nodes, each let's say terabyte of data, and suddenly you want to iterate for all the data and put it back into a cluster, that doesn't sound very practical. So whenever you want to do apply some change to that, um, ideally you you would do that where the data is. In this case, in the cluster itself just like you would do with databases. And when you think about the grid, um, usually that means this is pretty much uh, means the same as having the thing clustered, you know, multiple processes working together as a single group. So when you interact with Hazel Cast as a map, it might appear for you like on the left picture, like a continuous, continuous object where you put and take stuff. But what's happening actually is that you have multiple you have multiple nodes with data with data that's partitioned and with backups maintained. So it might look like one continuous map, but it's not. The data is spread over the whole cluster. I, I, with backups or no, it depends on the configuration. And uh, usually, where um, so and there is um, usually. Um, People put it in a couple of places in the architectures. There's obviously the most common, I mean, the, the most boring one is that you have a cluster somewhere in there and you write logic that gets and puts it by yourself. So imagine you have a data source, a database, REST service, whatever that you want data uh, store in a distributed memory, in a memory store. Now you can write this logic by yourself. Um, so you could do something like, um, if there is check if there is a value in the hazel cast if it's not read it from a data source then put it into a hazel cast and then return it or the other way around when you save data you would like to you could save it to hazel cast and then update the data store or the other way around to save data to data store and then update hazel cast and perhaps say okay um but suddenly from a trivial problem becomes complicated if you start thinking about the world of distributed systems and potential uh, chance for a dual write. Because suddenly, if you want to be successful with that, you need to make a dual write with a transaction between two systems. So imagine again, if you try to save something by yourself to a, uh, to a Hazelcast cluster and to a database, 
in which order do you do that? If you write to a Hazelcast first and then to a database, your write to database can fail. And then instead of eventual consistency, you have permanent inconsistency. Uh, if you do the other way around, it's a bit better because you save the database, but you, let's say the write to database to Hazelcast fails. And now um, it's just a hot, instead of a hot cache, you have a cold cache. Um, so anyway, that's a, that's a very simple problem that turns out to be quite complex. Uh, but usually there are, there are solutions for that. So one of the most common ones is that you would actually put Hazelcast in front of your data source. And the data source, I mean, it's not just database, whatever you want, you want it to be. Um, so instead of you reading stuff directly, both from Hazelcast or data store and managing that, you kind of let Hazelcast worry about that for you. So if you if you if you try to read from a Hazelcast and something is not there, it can get backloaded for you by Hazelcast itself directly from a database and make it accessible for you. The same would work the other way around. So if you try, if you want to write something into a database and you want to make it and you want to, don't worry about maintaining the state between Hazelcast and database, um, you write it to Hazelcast only and Hazelcast flashes into a database synchronously. But that might be not good for you because that thing can be slow. Because you might ask me a question, Greg, I wanted my application to be fast. And so now you are telling me that instead of writing to my database directly, I need to write to Hazelcast that will write synchronously to my database directly. This needs to be slower than writing to a database directly. And that's true, but it's a, it's a trade-off. So if you want to have lower complexity, um, that's, what, uh, that's what you can get for the exchange of you know, extra latency. But if you're about the lowest possible latency, but you're okay with trading off other stuff, you could go for the right behind. And the right, the way the right behind works is that you actually write to Hazelcast, but that's where the that's where the request stops and Hazelcast flashes it to a database later on uh, asynchronously, which is also, which also can generate some trouble if you think about it, if that operation doesn't work or happens a bit too late. But again, that's all trade-offs. Some of you might say, okay, I wanted the cache, I wanted the in-memory data store to make it fast. But, and, you, and you are telling me that we need to start the network call to a Hazelcast to, to get my stuff from there. Performing a network call to cache doesn't sound like something that's, that, that's fast or reasonable. So if that's the something you are worried about, another thing, another layer to introduce is a near side, near cache, near, uh, client side caching. So um, if you access some data quite often, you can make sure that this data gets stored locally in an efficient cache and read from that. Obviously, in the setup, you trade your eventual consistency is a bit more eventual than in the other ones, but at least you get much lower latency. But this talk is not about caching in general. That's that's what you can do to get your data inside Hazelcast. But Hazelcast itself is now um, something more than a cache. So um, we've been doing that pretty with with a success. Um, but things started changing. Cloud containers, Kubernetes appeared, and they started changing things around. Which means, which meant that we need to readjust how we do things and to be on top of the market. Nowadays, uh, also the um, the hardware and storage, especially NVMe SSDs, they became so fast that it's actually, you know, the the gap between RAM and hard drive is no longer that huge. So we need to start it adjusting for the market, not just because of the storage got faster, but also because. Um, Let's say you have different expectations when it comes to when you work with cloud containers, Kubernetes, Docker, and so on. And it starts with some very super tiny things. So it starts with tiny things like inconvenient file-based configuration. So um, normally the way you would configure, you know, a tool like that, you would craft an XML file or YAML file, um, and you know, provision it somewhere where the nodes are supposed to be started. And it's not a big deal if you are in production because, but it's pretty annoying if suddenly you want to start your container and update just a single line. You know, you just want to switch to turn health checks on or something like that. Suddenly something so trivial becomes annoying because you need to suddenly now craft that file and make sure it's provisioned in the right place. Mount in 
you need to figure it out. And that's annoying, but can be improved. Another thing is, um, so when we were speaking about the compute capabilities of Hazelcast and you know uh, cluster side computation, you need to somehow provide the logic to do that. Um, and in order to do that, you would probably you would normally need to uh, provide some upload some custom jars to to make it available on the Hazelcast class path. And this can be annoying because again, you need to figure out how to craft that file. Um, you have how to craft a jar properly shade, you know, repackage dependencies, and then again, pre-provision it for Hazelcast to make it available out there. Um, and this is this is, is as annoying, the, the upload part is as annoying as it was in the first example, but imagine in targeting non-Java developers. Imagine targeting Golang developers or Python developers and telling, forcing them to write Java code, figure out how to work with Maven, how to package that, and then how to debug class loading issues because they probably messed something up. That, that doesn't sound very promising. Another thing is that auto scaling is quite complex. You might be thinking, okay, so um, if there is, we look at the memory threshold, if it gets big enough, then we you know, provision more nodes. If it gets lower, we downscale. But if you start thinking about various use cases that, uh, that can happen and that not all use cases are heavy on memory, some are CPU heavy. Uh, plus you can't really drastically auto scale because that could trigger repartitioning. So if you start playing with that and thinking about that, that gets way complex. It's not just looking at one, it's not just looking at one metric and be able to you know, scale up, scale down, but it's a, it's a PhD thesis to do it effectively without you know, any disruptions to act to, without causing bigger disruptions to the system than you know, running out of memory could. Um, and one more thing that's pretty interesting is that Quite often in cloud and containers, we are dealing with unreasonable resource allocation. So you might be laughing that, okay, because the, the way Hazelcast works internally, it uses staged event-driven architecture, which is a very fancy term for having multiple thread pools connected by queues pretty much. So when the request comes into Hazelcast, it's accept either there's a thread pool that's reading from the socket, it's passing it next to the next thread pool that's doing some other stuff, then it's going to the next thread pool that's writing to a partition. And that sounds reasonable, but if you start thinking about how to fine tune it to find you know, the perfect balance, uh, this depends on many factors and probably you need to do it on a per host basis. Definitely, it depends on the number of CPUs that you have. And you know, like if we go out and send recomm and send tell recommendations, we recommend at least eight cores, recommend you know, at least a few gigs of memory. But then you go to the cloud and you deploy it to a you know to container with logical resource limitation of 0 0.75 of CPU and maybe even less and and you feel I'm ridiculously small amount of memory and this can get really really bad if your software is not ready for that yeah you might be laughing that um you know who runs your private action software on one CPU but in the cloud you actually do that quite often and one of the iterations of Hazel cloud, class cloud they actually used to run with like one one cpu uh, we did change that but that was also the issue um and the biggest change was java wasn't the main it's not the main choice anymore let's be honest if you are thinking about cloud technologies um people usually think you know golang python node.js java is quite often not the main choice so we needed also adjust for that and come up with something that's not it's not java centric uh, so, well, we are still, we are not going to abandon Java. We are not going to change that, but we can make our life easier for people that don't write Java, but still would like to use, would like to use the tool itself. And all of this starts with very simple, you know, very simple ideas. Like you can make people lives easier in containers and Docker. Um, if you replace, if you replace, you know, um, or if you give an opportunity to get rid of you know, files and start using environmental variables, because it's way easier. Uh, building polyglot first means adjusting some things. So if you wanted to be very successful with serialization in Hazelcast, you would need to implement your own serialized deserializers that were capable of partial deserialization for the sake of you know, compute capabilities. Uh, but this is, that someone needs to write that. It's a very boring code, but now you're forcing a Golang person to write that, and we don't want that. So we came up in a new 
serialization, custom protocol of serialization that that zero config. So you don't need to write any Java code or any code to actually have it properly serialized. The schema can be derived directly from your objects regarding the language you are using. Um, all the compute side computations and all the querying that you could do with Java code, now we are replacing with an SQL engine, which means that you can use a polyglot tool that's, that, that's better suited for the job than implementing your own Java code and uploading it to a cluster itself. And this is already rolled out in the product to make it easier to, to use. Another thing is, if you, you've been paying attention to the previous uh, previous architecture diagrams of re, uh, re, write, um, write through, read through, you just need to realize that there is code to be written to make that happen. Because if you want Hazelcast to be able to read something from a database for you, you need to write that code and deploy it in there, which is again, another time you are exposed to writing Java code. What would be better than that? Just to be able to provide configuration so that there is some predefined tool that does it for you, for the you know, data source of your, of your choice. And is it supposed to happen? <laughs> so the, the, the better way to do that would be you know, to be able to declaratively provide configuration and have it you know, work automatically out of the box for you. So that's also the part of the revolution that's, that, that, that's coming. Actually, it's about to come in 5.2, which will be released you know, in a probably hopefully in a couple of days. Um, but our legal team probably would uh, would advise me to tell me that I'm lying before the presentation. So you can now you will be able to use SQL not just for um, not just for uh, not just querying, um, not just you know some compute side capabilities, but also for streaming itself. And when I'm mentioning streaming, we've, we've had that product for a while, here's a Casjet, which was doing quite well. Uh, on the market. And fun fact, this was written a uh, long time ago before Project Loom, before anyone ho you know, uh, hoped, envisioned Project Loom, you know, making it to any Java release. Um, so we as a company, we, we needed that feature. So we kind of wrote it ourselves and it's described in the white paper. Um, now we are thinking if we shouldn't switch to Loom, um, but that's, a, that's, that's, that's another story. So we've had that, real-time streaming capabilities of a different product. Uh, we had um, the, the Hazelcast IMDG product and the streaming product depended on Hazelcast itself because it would use Hazelcast as uh, for its own needs. Um, and the thing happened. And so at some point in time, we figured out, hey, that's actually one product we are having. So if we want someone to be able to use Hazelcast Jet, they would still need to use Hazelcast. So we kind of merged them together, forming one, which created quite nice opportunities because companies they've been, that have been running on Hazelcast 4, they upgraded to Hazelcast 5. And now we can tell them, look, you can do cool stuff, um, not, just, not just use Hazelcast as your uh, commodity to so be able to use it for, you know, for caching, but now you, have a, you can use something to you can use stream processing to derive something from the data that you have there already. Um, the cool part is that most of that is public. So if you want to learn about the, if you want to, uh, as an engineer, if you want to study design docs or the architecture, uh, we are not always super good at making everything public, but quite a lot of that is going public. So you can read in, read about the decisions that needed to be made in order to make product, uh, to make a successful stream processing engine. And if you want to, um, if you want to, you know, have a uh, see actual hands-on examples, there's there's a repo with that, uh, with the first one being Bitcoin Dev Cross, kind of relevant nowadays. Um, so pretty fun stuff. So that's how we moved slowly, how we from, uh, and how we are moving from a cache to a platform that's mostly focused around streaming, with uh, with great. Enrich, enriching capabilities since the data is already in the nodes that are doing the stream processing. Um, but if you want to do all of that, you still successfully, you still need to be aware of quite a lot of things. You need to answer questions like, how many nodes do I need? How much memory do I need? Uh, how many cores should be on each machine? Um, 
do how many backups do you want do i want backups to be synchronous or asynchronous um if i want to synchronize two clusters how do i do that do i make one huge cluster or do i set up one replication between them and if i set up one replication what parameters do i choose for us that um and it's quite a lot of questions to answer so it turned out there is a need on the market for simplicity so we created a cloud product hazelcast viridian which is an opinionated version of hazelcast where um um, we call it serverless, but to be more precise, it's memberless or nodeless. Obviously, there are members and nodes, but uh, you don't think about that. The abstraction we use is that we use user data. So I want to process two gigabytes of data, and you don't care about how many members are actually doing the job. So you pay for the data that you are using. And we launched it in the preview early beta mode around, around a month ago. It's out there. You can You can try it out. Um, besides that, we started working, we noticed that there are some pieces missing. Like, for example, you can put your stuff in an, uh, in the, in the map, but you can't really do fun stuff like change data capture. The fun part was that we already had inside the, inside the project, a tool that would, you know, internal journal that would keep uh, track of all the operations happening to the map. It wasn't just a public API. So we made it possible for IMAP to be a source of our data capture. But that's where we come to the fun part. So with storage getting faster, we figured out we need to change things around. So one of the biggest features that are coming soon is the tiered storage, which means that um, we'll be using both uh, RAM and hard disk and hard drives to ensure um, to store data. Um, hot data will be kept purely in memory, but now you'll be able to offload data to a disk, which means that members will be able to support way bigger loads than in the past. And here comes the, the fun part, which is the, um, we call it Project Alter, Hazelcast 6 next gen, or generally a bunch of crazy ideas that we are experimenting with. So remember when I told you about this uh, suboptimal resource allocation and that stage even driven architecture of Hazelcast with thread pools and queues? Um, there is something better on the market than that, way simpler and way easier. So imagine that instead of having that complicated amount, you know, a couple of thread pools and queues, you have just a couple of threads which, uh, color, which are colorated with the number of physical cores that you have on a machine. And instead of having the, the thread pool, you let the one, I mean, you let the thread do all the work. Everything from reading from a socket to writing to a partition by itself. And it turns out that if you do that, and if you, if you are able to remove uh, necessary blocking code, if you, if you can remove unnecessary allocations, you can do much better because suddenly there is no synchronization. If there is one thread doing the work, reading from a socket and writing to a, uh, to a partition thread, to a, to a partition that, that it owns, there is, there is no need to have uh, concurrent data structures in there. Because it is a boring single threaded code within the scope of one single thread. Um, and you don't waste time on synchronization. If you don't waste time on synchronization and you can, uh, that means that you are way closer to bare metal than you would be if you were, if you needed to block somewhere along the way. And we say we have some early, we have some early prototypes of that, and the increase of uh, throughput is quite exciting. Yeah, when it comes to the raw, raw numbers, this can be at least you know one uh, uh, one order of magnitude faster. The cool part about that, well, obviously to make it happen, we'll need to redo some things, redo how we think about storage. Uh, for example, use uh, um, IOU ring being uh, 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 bindings. Um, we will need to rewrite our internal data structures, but we still should be able to provide it, you know, as a preview feature in one of the in one of the future releases, and even current data structures should be able to work with that. Since the um, so another quite uh, bold move we are trying to make is we are trying to see if we could go storage first. So with NVMe SS SSDs and um, and asynchronous I/O, this is potentially doable. Uh, so when we are introducing tiered storage now, but perhaps in the future that there the in-memory tier might 
disappear. Uh, but again, this is still very early stage. We don't really have much um, concrete data about that. Um, but one more change that we'd like to make is we'd like to be schema first. So now we some uh, we do have schema, but it's kind of used internally by our civilization protocols. But we don't really do anything cool with that. Once you go schema first, your not only your SQLs get get way easier because you can go start with create table and not by putting data inside. But once you control the lay the um, once we are in charge of the, if you know the schema, if you know the upfront, how your data will look like, you can optimize it for the storage. So all of those are kind of closely related. So there's a quite, so there is a chance in the future we might end up with, you know, thread per core, Hazelcast, which is storage first and schema first with everything being accessible through SQL. So that's, that's, the, that's the part we are experimenting with. And I think it's pretty, pretty exciting. Oh, and I think we will start rolling it out the cloud first quite soon. Um, it's way easy. So if we, we we are planning to set up something called Alpha Bleeding Edge Stream for Hazelcast Viridian so that the tools are available, right? Uh, as they can be continuously deployed there and for you to try. Obviously, you shouldn't run production workloads in there, uh, but it's, it should be a very easy way for you to try those things. So... That's pretty much all what I would like to tell you about Hazelcast and, and the journey and what we are doing with the product. Uh, if you have any questions, tell me. And I think it's soon time to dive hands on and see if the architect can, can still code. Okay, thank you. So do we do a break or? It's up to you. And now we have the issue with the lights, so it's very cool. It's very cool, more romantic, but you can see. Folks, do we do five minutes break? Five minutes break? Maybe questions? Okay. Yeah. Five minutes break. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So so you are creating as a library Hey, you made this thing. Yeah, 
And the third one was Checking the result in five nine is seven I'm 
Okay, so we'll be starting in five minutes, let's say. Okay, okay you will be starting now. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, so now time for the practical part. So in the first time I was telling you more about the product we're working on, but now I'd like to give you some concrete knowledge about Comptable Future and asynchronous programming in Java. And this is not going to be introductory session, um, but if you don't know anything about the subject, don't worry, you should still learn a lot. Um, in this session, um, we'll be focusing on the weird parts. We're focusing on weird, unconventional, surprising, and unintuitive parts of Comfortable Future uh, that did strike me on production a couple of times. Uh, not just me, but um, a couple of other people as well. So I do still have a, a couple of slides, but the session will be mostly live, live coded, hopefully. So Let's start with the basics. So synchronicity is beautiful. It's simple. You have two processes. That will, you, you have lines of code. You, you go one line, second line, third one. When the first one end, starts, when the first one ends, uh, then the second one starts. It's easy, convenient, simple, and not performant at all. Um, because if you if you if everything is happening within a single thread with one execution unit, that's going to be slow. That's why we have multiple CPUs, multiple threads, virtual threads, whatever, and we can run stuff in parallel and asynchronously. And this is absolutely this is absolute basis for pretty much all, all yeah, I think all the systems out there, all the software out there, and all the processes outside of software as well. Um, however, this becomes way more complicated because um, suddenly if you just launch operators asynchronously and there is no control over when one starts and the second stops and they just they flow independently from each other, things become difficult. And the first question is, how do you get stuff back? Because if you if you create a if you create a second process, you let you make it, you know, calculate something for you. And then you need to somehow get it back. But how do you do that? So smart people came up with the concept of future promise as uh, some uh, people coming from different backgrounds can know, which is like a magical place where the result of asynchronous computation is eventually appears. So you can think about this um, like an optional, but with a temporal aspect. So you have an, something that a wrapper which represents the result of a computation. So normally it probably starts being empty. And then after some time passes, the, the result appears there. And that's the whole clue, the idea of the, of the future. So you call some method, you get a future, which means that, which indicates that the operation is being computed asynchronously. And then you can call dot get and wait for the future to, uh, to return the value for you. And the real value comes from that, that you can squeeze some code in between those two lines. So before you go, uh, you call some method, you do something else, and then you come back when you are done so that you can get your result back. And the cool part is that any method can become asynchronous because you take a synchronous method, you run it in separate thread, and then you can wait for the 
for the result. And in Java, we have two base implementations. There is the standard future from Java U2 concurrent JDK 1.5 times and comfortably future from Java 8. Oh, that, that, that's eight years already. Okay, that's old. Um, uh, which was supposed to fix some underlying issues of the simplistic uh, classic future. And as you can see, um, there's not the screen. Let me turn on presentation mode for you. Let's create a simple executor. Um, if we want to execute something asynchronously, it's as easy as going for uh, submit on an executor and provide it with a runnable or a callable. And if you start looking at the API itself, it's pretty. It's it's not not a lot of stuff there. There's get a method which will block indefinitely and wait for the operation to come back. There's a get with timeout. There's cancellation. There's is cancelled and is done methods, and that's all you can do, uh, which is pretty limiting. Because if you start thinking about now about things like, uh, let's say I want to. Um, I have a few operations happening at the same time. Imagine you are building a Forex exchange and you are responsible to make it as fast as possible. So for example, if you want to figure out the currency exchange, you might want to issue a few parallel requests to different exchange currency providers and you know, take only the first one, that the value that comes first. And if you have the blocking API in such a way as it is now, how do you implement that? Of course, it's doable if you have um, so if you have if you have full control over what how the um, process is created and received, you can figure out that perhaps there should be a queue somewhere, and instead of returning values via futures, when they complete, they should put something into a blocking queue that you can wait on, and so on. This is not something that can be fixed, but is pretty annoying and well requires conscious thinking about that. Plus, the bigger problem is that it has blocking, fully blocking API. So, let's say you receive a um, you receive a, 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 a future, and you want to do something asynchronously when it completes. There is no not really no, there's really no way to do that in Java because the API is blocking. You need to block, wait, and then perform computation. Um, when it comes to exception handling capabilities, they are limited. So if you do, if you call dot get, it blocks, and there there might be an exception happening, and that's pretty much all. And a future can be manually completed. So um, it's generally the old school future is one to one bound to the underlying thread. Actually, if you look at the uh, if you look over, there is some interesting interface called runnable future. As you can see, it's both a runnable, a task, and a future with the, the holder of the value, which might seem a bit weird. Uh, but since, the, but in Java, since in older Java, there was always this one-to-one -one mapping. So there's you execute something in the executor service, and the thread is bound to a future. It's executing the job and returning the value, then finishing the job. It was easy back then. So it's quite natural for the future class to not expose any API, which would allow you to manually set the value, set the exception or manipulate that. Um, and the biggest problem is that when you needed to work with multiple futures or write reactive style pipelines that when one operation ends, the second one starts or joining them together, it was always, it was pretty much impossible. The exception handling, well, it, it was better without lights, if you ask me. Uh, so exception handling looks pretty much that way. Um, and before JDK, we we're pretty much forced to use an external uh, first party features. And one of the most common ones was listenable future from Guava, which was a bit better because you could register listeners uh, on the future. Uh, but we are still speaking about JDK seven times. Which means there was no the lambda expressions looked uh, they didn't look like 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 we know them right now, 
we actually we, we did have lambda expressions before that they were just super ugly so that, that's that's how lambda expressions used to, used to look like in the before jdk8 so if, if someone's telling you there were no lambda expressions in java before eight it's not true they were there all the time they were just one of the ugliest ones you can find on the market um Oh, this is internally they, they, they are a bit different, but the, the same idea. You still had a chance to provide a, a piece of action, a piece of code uh, to another to another method, but you need to provide and you create an anonymous inner uh, class to be able to to do that. So it was still pretty ugly, and that's where JDK eight Comptable Future comes into play, which was supposed to address all of those issues, and it was. It was a uh, nice, nice change because now you go comfortable future. Oh, by the way, in Java, you need to pay attention to the backwards compatibility. So unfortunately, we couldn't, there, there was no way to change the existing classes. So executor, so if you use the old way of submitting uh, tasks to executors, they will still give you um, the old future. So in order to maintain backward compatibility, you need to, that needed to say the same. So you got new methods to do that. So if you want to submit something, you go directly through a static methods from Comptable Future. And here we go. Here it is. And now if you start looking at the API, well, that's that's a lot of stuff to, to do. There is complete exceptionally, complete, then apply, when complete, join, then combine, compose, exceptionally, exceptionally apply to either than accept, then apply async and around 60 methods, probably a bit more than you would expect and enough to get people confused. Um, so, but the main difference was that you could manually complete them. So you could complete it with a value uh, or you could complete it with an exception. And there was no longer that binding between a thread and, and the future itself. The future itself can be created right away without any help. You just go new completable future, and that's all. You can join on that, and you will get a deadlock. Uh, but still, it's nice that you get this level of granularity, granularity when it comes to working with that. And the coding style changed because now you could do quite a lot of asynchronous operation declarative style. So, so if you enjoyed optional streams and all of the goodies in JDK8, you will enjoy this one as well. If you've, if you've enjoyed um, Project Reactor, um, Reactive Java in general, you will probably enjoy it a bit less because it's the less, because it's not as sophisticated as uh, reactive programming, but still it gives you those vibes. So when you get a future with a value, you can go declaratively, then apply something to that method. Uh, you can go, then do something else, and then run something, you know, like say finished, and you still get a future after each of those calls. So at the end, you can call join, run it, and you'll see that. Oh, we are actually not printing it out. Probably we should uh, then accept. And you can see that's working. So it's very convenient. It's nice. It's asynchronous. Uh, but unfortunately, there are some interesting problems that you can uh, that you can encounter. By the way, so this is again, this talk is not about the basics, but if you want to learn the basics after the talk, there are, there's this guy, Tomasz Norkiewicz, who wrote a book about reactive programming and has quite a lot of materials on uh, comfortable future and reactive programming in general. So that, that's the one for you. And we'll start first with a very common issue, which means the cancellation of the future. Why is it a problem? Because so. We have this old school thread pool. We submit something in there. Not, not a very lengthy operation. And it was common that you can just cancel it out and say make interruptive running, which and that operation would cancel a future and interrupt and send an interruption to a thread that was executing the future. And it's natural. You get a result, you get a future, and then you can cancel the, the operation that's trying to execute that. 
unfortunately, these things have changed in the comfortable future itself. Um, but it's pretty tricky because let's go back here. And we do still have a cancel operation because comfortable future still implements the old school future interfaces. And you might, and you might be asking, so where's the problem? Well, let's run it. Let's see if we cancel the future. Oh, wait, let me join on that to actually see. Uh, so this is canceled, but CF1, join. Let's see what happens. Well, you have cancellation exception at future main. Well, the cancellation clearly works, right? Um, so let's have, a, let's have a closer look at what's happening internally. Oh, well, we don't even need to dive deep. We, just, we can just read the docs. And there's an explanation what this parameter does. So the main interruptive running parameter flag is used to tell that the underlying thread should be interrupted. But with control future, this value has no effect in this implementation because interrupts are not used to control processing. And it, if you start thinking, I mean, so this might be weird, this might be surprising, but if you start thinking that the if control future doesn't have one-to-one -one mapping with a thread, suddenly it becomes a bit more reasonable. However, it's still surprising that you just can't cancel an operation. And again, if you start thinking about you know building a bit more complex uh, piece of, uh, code pipelines like this one, you receive a future, then you apply something to that. You then combine with another future, and then you run. So what should happen? So imagine you cancel the future return by then run. Should it cancel only the last future, or should it cancel everything and trace it back to the source? Um, but what happened? What if the original thread, or what if the original future is completed not by one thread, but by multiple threads? Should that cancellation be propagated to all the threads that could potentially um, complete the future? And how do you even track them? Because there, there's, there's no mechanism that allows you to track all the threads that are about to complete something. This can be any thread, this can be zero threads. What do you do? So that sounds like a simple problem, but again, pretty complex if you start digging into, uh, into the trenches. Um, and if you ask me for a result and for an answer, pretty much there is no way to cancel an underlying thread if you, go, if you start with a future itself. Um, unfortunately, there is no way. Um, if you control both sides, if you control the thread pool that submits the, the uh, jobs and then computers, then you can manually deal with that. Uh, but there is no way if you are just re a receiver of a computer future from, from outside. And that's the fact you need to accept that there is no way to propagate cancellation into that thread. Um, so for example, in one of my libraries, I wrote a library, it's called Perl Collectors, and it used to kind of give you both um, Perl streams, but with custom thread pools that of your choice. Um, so in, internally, I do hack it out. So for example, you can you know you can track the future, all the tasks that are about to complete the future. Okay, but this works only because I'm in a full control on top of what from what gets uh, submitted and uh, and then the receiving side. So it's not a generic solution. It works only for a very specific scenario and it's still pretty ugly. Um, and that's how we slowly move to another small surprising thing. So we already covered cancellations, but now let's for a second move and have a look at some of the public API methods from Completable Future. So we'll start with uh, all of and any of, which don't do uh, what you expect them to do. So let's create manually a couple of futures. Make it with integer. And there's a second one. And what do you want to do? Uh, how, how would you approach an, something like waiting for all of those futures to, to complete? Luckily, there is a there's a helper method called all of, where you can provide CF1, CF2, and wait for the com uh, completion of all of those futures. Um, so if we have a look at the result of that method, it can be already it can be already a bit weird because 
Well, you have two futures of type integer. You want to wait for all of them. And then the result is computable feature of void. Um, so is the first confusion. And why, why would you do that? I mean, if you are waiting for a completion of two futures, um, it would be kind of reasonable to wait for the, uh, to receive a list of objects at least in that, in that future. But it's not happening. So um, let's investigate what this method is doing. So it's also doing one more weird thing. Um, I mean, it's doing quite a lot of weird things, um, but let's look at the, uh, let's, uh, well, that's actually the reasonable part. That's the, that's the most reasonable part, actually. It's internally creating a completion tree, which is quite efficient at propagation completion for the complex, uh, complex uh, counter of future chains. Um, but the, the part that I'm concerned about is that. So the all of method accepts uh, the var args, which is I'm okay with, uh, but it accepts the counter future of with a, with a wild card inside, which means you can provide futures of different types to it. And I'm thinking, what's the use case for that? Why would you wait? Let's imagine you have a free fish futures. You are you are, one is returning string, second is returning integer, third one is returning a car. Okay, and suddenly you need to wait for all of those three to finish. Okay, I can think of some use cases, but it's rather uncommon. Quite often, more likely you are to wait for uh, futures of the same containing the same types. And even if there was generics thrown into the picture in here, um, you could still use an object if you wanted to wait for futures of multiple types. So not only we are waiting for futures of different types, but they are returning a comfortable future of void. Uh, again, it's, it's a bit weird, but let's see how it behaves. So we have that future here. Let's call it result. Um, so we go result, join, and we block. We run it. Well, both futures that are never completed, so we have a deadlock situation. Well, works as expected, I would say so far. Um, so let's now complete those futures. Come to the future one, uh, complete with one, and completable future two, complete with two. We run it, and the process completes immediately. Well, naturally, because both are completed, worked as expected. If I complete only the first one and run it, the process deadlocks because, well, it's waiting indefinitely for a computable futures to completion. If we replace first uh, the order and we, the, we don't, uh, we complete the second one and not the first one, it behaves as expected, right? We have a deadlock. Um, but now let's try to think what's going to happen if we introduce exceptions into a picture. So the second one, let's try to complete it, but with an exception, with a null pointer exception. Oh uh, yeah, so yeah, right. So that's not going to complete, but if we do that with the second one, well, I'm, well, it forwards the null pointer exception wrapped in the completion exception, which, which is reasonable, right? Because we had, we did accept a couple of futures and one of it failed. And now, well, obviously we didn't get the list of objects we wanted. So it failed. So mm, let's now, sounds, sounds right, okay? So let's make it a bit more complex. So let's remove the first completion. What would you expect to happen in a situation like that? So you have a computer future of all the futures. One completes with an exception, second never completes. What would, how would you expect it to behave? Hmm? How? Fail as soon as possible. Fail as soon as possible, right? Probably with the null pointer exception. So um, it's not going to complete at all because it's waiting not for successful completions, but for all the completions. So despite the fact that we know that those futures will never complete successfully, will never get results, um, we are still waiting because it's waiting for any completions. So if, if, we com if we complete the first one with an exception as well, that's when it will complete and tell you, okay, that was a null pointer exception. And that's a quite a common issue. And it's also common in uh, open source libraries, because for example, if you look at the, 
Um, if you look at the code from that I found it recently in test containers, it has that issue. And I and I issued a pull request. You know, they do quite a lot of interesting stuff there, and they still go control future all of. So if you start, you know, 10 containers, you know, 10 Kafka instances, but one of them is misconfigured and fails immediately, you will still wait a couple of minutes for all the start to start back, only to be presented with, oh, we failed, sorry. Um, so this is quite a common issue that, 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 that you can find. And how do you fix it? Unfortunately, the, the fix is, um, there's no easy fix for that. So you need to kind of write and fix that method by yourself. And let's try to do that. Um, we could start with that original method, just fix it a bit. So how would we fix it? So there is a lot. Uh, we would like to short circuit. Uh, at the same time, I think we could improve the uh, what we accept here. So we'd probably like to have some generics in here. So computer features of the same type. Perhaps we could make it a list. Instead of works, let's call it called futures. Um, and instead of returning void, we could go for a list of t. So when all the so we would like to make sure that this is all about successful completions. If there is a if, if there is something completes exceptionally, we immediately uh, propagate that to the to the result. And how do we do that? Because that the method signature looks okay now. And actually, the, the best thing that we can do here is that try to reuse that all of as much as possible, because that internal completion tree is pretty cool. We don't want to rewrite that, but still, we would need to adjust a few things. So let's go for that. Contable future, all of. And now we need to pass an array into that. So we have this complex task of converting a list into an array. In order to do that, you need to pass a new array instance into the two array method. And here comes a very important question. What number do we initialize the array when one converting from a list to, a, to an array? Well, well, the reasonable one is right with the original, the size of the original collection, right? Future size. Is it how it should be? Why? What's wrong? Sounds reasonable, okay? I am converting a list into an array and I'm providing an array of the same size as the original list. What's wrong with that? Actually, this is even IntelliJ is telling me to do that. The answer is zero. Do you have any clue why is that? Not working in the memory. Not the location is um, so actually there is, there is a very nice old blog post from Alexei Shipilev. Uh, which has a lot, probably like 60 pages of assembly to explain that. Uh, but the, the, sh the short answer is that when you create an array of non-zero size, JVM needs to spend time to zero those types. And if you start with zero, and, and still they need to be overwritten with actual values. Uh, but if you start with zero, um, there is no, that, that you skip that stage and elements get initialized with the actual values of the, um, uh, that are in the in the list, uh, but the cool part about that is that they what they introduced because look this is that API is not great because it puts a burden on the developer to choose the size of an array, so that could be improved. And since JDK, I don't remember which one you have that third option where instead of providing uh, your own array instance, you can provide a function uh, array factory pretty much, so that the JVM and Java can choose the proper size by themselves, by itself. So in future versions of Java, you'd like to do, and future, oh God, that's probably like JDK9. You can do something like that. It doesn't let me do that because it's, I'm on JDK8 here, um, but it's from JDK11. So the best way you can do is just not worry about that, pass a function to the two array and let the JVM choose that. And if you go inside, you will see that actually they are providing zero as a start. But since I'm JDK8, let's roll back a bit. That's just an interesting, interesting trivia. So we already have the result. It just, it's not short circuiting and it doesn't have anything inside, but it does one thing pretty well. In case of successful completion, it uh, lets you know that the original collection is ready to be processed. 
that all the features inside are already finished and you can non-blocking way join on them. So let's use that fact to our advantage. So we can go for the result and say, once it's complete, then apply. Here there is this void that we can, that, that has nothing inside obviously. So we can kind of ignore that. In the past, you would use just one underscore, but it's a reserved keyword. So uh, you need to use two now or more if you want. Um, and now we can just pretty much ignore, like ditch totally the, the argument and go back to our original list of futures and process it just like we would have you know, a list of optionals because we know those values are inside. So we go for stream map, comfortable future, join, collect to list. And here we are. So here is the method that allows you to already that returns from the future of lists with values. We are just missing one important part, which is short circuiting. And in order to, to fix that, you need to introduce a form of uh, race to make it happen. So we have a result, uh, the computer future, which will complete when all the futures success complete, regardless of if they are successful or not. But the cool part about computer future is that you can complete them manually. So let's introduce this phrase. So let's say, futures uh, for each uh, for each future and when complete so if each future completes with a for non-null forable then complete that original one with and with that probable and that's how we manually implemented short circuiting because what we say is that as soon as one of those complete exceptionally complete it with the complete the resulting one and now it's no longer an issue so let's go back to this case here where we have two and they um well that actually completes but let's remove the first one yeah and it blocks forever so now let's replace that control future all off with our all of short circuit let's just get rid of that Let's update that because we are expecting a list of integer, I believe. Um, this needs to be a list. And now once we join, we get an exception, short secreting pretty much, well, immediately. And that's, um, if you, so whenever you need to use it in the project, luckily it's easy to Google. So you will find some variations of that. Just be mindful that many solutions that you find on Stack Overflow, they don't feature that part. So you will not get the short circuiting that you are after. And here I have that code, but I just wrote it myself. Yeah? How, how can we that the portable is, is not? Uh, because when future, future can complete either successfully or not successfully. Because they can be successful in that. Yeah. Yes. And we care only about the case where forable is non-null which means complete it with an exception. That's why we do the check. Um, and then it's safe to just race with the original one and say, okay, you are complete. You are, you are, when, as soon as something completes exceptionally, we say, okay, you will complete that exceptionally before the original uh, completion of the co aggregated future happens. Um, so a kind of similar story is with the any of method. So if you think about it, um, it also looks weird because look, it accepts a var, uh, var args of a futures of various types um, and it returns, which is surprising, an object. So um, if you start thinking, so now if you found, you found a use case that you want to wait for any of futures like representing you know, a car, person, employee, integer, uh, whatever, now luckily you get something in return in the future that completed, but it completes with an object. So it's up to you to do your, you know, instance of, you know, duties uh, if you decide to do it like that. And any of also doesn't return the first one that completed successfully. It returns if the first one completed with an exception, it will let it will propagate the exception further. So if you decide, to, it can be quite surprising. So sometimes there are people, you know, using on on any of on a couple of futures, and then they are getting exceptions. Why did they get exception? Because but that second method, the second one completed. No, but the first one that completed was with an exception, so it propagated an exception further. Um, so it's it's pretty weird. Um, 
I was supposed to write that, but since I already skipped too many slides, I will just explain you how it works. And again, unfortunately, you need to rewrite that. That's a bit more complex. So we can fix the original implementation by introducing generics and ensuring that if we accept all the futures of the same type, we return a few comfortable future containing that type. So that's a bit easier. But now you can't really piggyback on top of any of, but instead of you need to write it by yourself. So you need to create your own future, um, then manually say that whenever any of the original future is completed, they then complete the, our future. But this doesn't cover all the use cases. Um, this covers uh, this doesn't cover the, use, the, the edge case where all of those future failed. So additionally, at the end, you can reuse all of methods and say, if all in check, if all the futures completed with an exception, then propagated an exception to an any of because an intuitive approach to any of would be return exception only when all the futures failed. If there's at least one, there's still a chance that one future can complete with a value, wait for it, right? But that's not the case. So if you want to go for that, there is an alternative alternative you can um you can go for. And we are propagating the first exception. First. Yes. Uh, just like original futures, there is no way to propagate an aggregation of exception. You propagate just the first one that that, that happened. And here comes the, the most interesting part, which means comfortable future versus threats, because this stuff yeah, this can get this can get interesting. Um, so let's go here. Um, I had a method. I removed it by accident. So at the beginning, when I started writing code here. Um, I'll get rid of that as well. We don't need it anymore. So when I started writing, I made an executor, new fixed thread pool, let's say 42 threads. I submitted something in here and gave us an old school future. And then I did completable future, uh, supply async, um, 42, and got future. Uh, do you see anything um, interesting about those three lines of code? I'll make it easier for you. I'll just remove the first two ones. I'll remove that one, and I'll remove this one. And it still compiles. So your computer future supply async with a, with a Lambda expression, it completes and it runs. So if we join on that and print the result, it will actually work. So it returns 42. But we didn't provide any execution utility for it to be run. So the question goes, where does it run? Because in the past, you need to have executor instance, you need to submit something on top of the executor. Um, and that's the part, that's the easy part, right? The obvious part. It would You would expect it to run on that executor. But if you go for computable future, supply async and return a value like that, where does it run? It clearly runs somewhere because you see the result, but on which thread pool? Because there needs to be something, right? But we didn't provide any. So we have a few options. So it could be running either by a thread that called it. It could be running by some randomly created thread pool on the fly. It could be running by some static thread pool. It could be running in the cloud. I don't know. Um, so let's try it out. Let's try it out. So before we go that, let's let's add here one more step. Let's say then uh, then apply. Um, we will ignore, we'll not do anything here, but here we'll add thread, current thread, um, get name. Oh wait, actually we can we can just do that earlier. We can do it right here. Um, should. Okay, so let's go for a current thread. It would, it would the main. Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. We will get to that. Uh, we'll get to that. So as you can see, you run some. We we try to see when it's being run, and it's run on the foreground pool, common pool worker, um, and that's the surprising part. So. Apparently, in the JVM, there is one static thread pool used by the whole JVM. 
It's called for drain pool. It was it was a JDK seven, and it has very specific purpose. So the design of the fork drain pool is not a normal pool. Normal pool where it looks the way that there is a bunch of threads, there is a queue in front of them, and that queue, their task going to the queue and then being uh, relayed on top of for the for the threads they use. The way, but that approach has uh, downsides. So just like with Hazelcast, state even the architecture versus thread per car, um, there is a problem. So whenever there are multiple threads trying to read something from a queue and there are multiple producers trying to push something into a queue you get into quite a lot of contention it's called multi-producer multi-consumer queue and that's something that will come down a lot the more threads you have the more producers the more they will need to be waiting for the synchronization to happen so threads are waiting for their job to be obtained but they are blocking on that and there's a wasted that's just a wasted throughput so what people well, what the, the original design of fork joint pool was okay let's adjust it in a bit different way so instead of having one big thread queue in front of the thread pool let's give every thread their own thread uh, their own queue so if every thread can read directly from their own queue with close to zero it's with synchronization you would gain but you would not content on that part at least way 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 less than with multi producer multi consumer queue um, so when the requests, they go to a thread, a thread drain pool, they get redistributed for the, for the threads, uh, among the thread and their thread pools, uh, queues, I mean, um, and if some of the threads run out of the tasks, they can do the work stealing and steal tasks from queues of other threads. That's the idea. And it's supposed to perform better, especially when the number of threads is correlated with the number of CPU cores. This is why there is just one central thread pool in the system. You can create more of them, but there is one central one because it's quite often, it's most often used for CPU intensive jobs. If you go into RS class and use any form of parallel, parallel processing and so on, it will be used for joint pool for that. Anything that's CPU heavy, you know, RI processing, you know, incrementation, maybe serialization, um, but not things like, you know, sending an HTTP request, waiting on a lock, um, you know, calling database. Those are blocking operations where a uh, huge part of that work is just waiting for the for some data to appear for you. Um, so generally, there is something called managed managed blocker that you can use with fork pool. So if you know that you will use a blocking operation, the fork drain pool will readjust for that. But if you are submitting blocking operations to fork drain pool, this can end up bad. Because that thread pool that's fine tuned for CPU intensive jobs suddenly is busy waiting on for nothing. So you so that's that's also why it's not a very good idea to go you know go command R on the whole project and replace stream with parallel stream because well if it's if it if it's parallel why not do that because it's easy right? But suddenly you might end up that if the one execution utility that's running all of that is in the center of your system might be polluted with blocking tasks and instead of doing you know cpu intensive job cpu intensive jobs might be waiting for them to come out of sleep and there's the op default execution utility for for drain pool uh for comfortable future so if you go supply async and don't specify a thread pool it automatically goes to for drain pool common pool and let's be honest quite if you do that you are quite often likely to run blocking operations there which is, uh, which is probably an unreasonable default API choice. It would be, a, I personally, I think it would be way better to have an all, only an option to choose a thread pool of your, of your choice. And if someone wanted to uh, run it on the fraudulent pool, you would need to manually say, okay, fraudulent pool, common pool, run it on that. Um, so that's an interesting design choice. But I'm, that's not fully true what I said. It's not always the first joint pool. Because let, let's actually see. Let's, let's see what's going on in here. Supply async. Yeah, there is some default pool, async pool. And so I wasn't fully correct. I said that it's for joint pool, common pool. Uh, it was in this case. But in some use cases, it can be thread per task executor. And the when, when is that? Use common pool. So Whenever for drain pool, get common pool parallelism is bigger than one, then use common pool. If not, use the 
um, use the thread per task executor. And how does it look like? As the name suggests, that's this whole there's a whole implementation. So the thread pool, it doesn't actually does any pulling. It creates a new thread and starts it. So uh, and there is a very good reason for that to be for it to be that way. Because if you have just one CPU, you probably don't want to have one thread that would be very easy to deadlock. So it's better to go for that approach where we're spawning separate threads to avoid potential, you know, uh, uh, liveness issues of your application. Although personally, I think we, it could have been at least a cached for a cached thread pool and not just a thread pool that just creates new threads on on each execute call. So. That's also why that's also why I do those talks together because now it's tightly related. So, because you might say, Greg, uh, but when for join pool common pool will be one thread, uh, probably on a CPU with uh, on a machine with one CPU of your grandma computer. But hey, but we are in the world of containers. We are in, in the in the cloud. We are in the cloud, and stuff like this happens, and um, turns out that quite often you might end up running on a machine with one CPU. So you might be thinking, okay, that's that's an edge case scenario that should never happen. But actually in the cloud, it's very easy to happen because you are not, we are quite often running with just one CPU. And if you start Googling that, you will see that's quite a lot of interesting issues caused by that. Even in my library, I had an issue like that because I didn't test on one CPU and I had the number of threads very, I had different logic happening when there was just one CPU. Because if there's just one CPU, you could, I could as well run everything synchronously, and I messed it up. So I had someone, you know, infinitely block on that, because my tests were not adjusted for that. So yeah, I also messed it up. So as you can see, it's quite quite interesting, quite interesting choice. Uh, but it's um, that I told you already. Um, that's the by the way library I wrote, but I'm not going to advertise that. But this is where the, but it's not the end of the fun. That's where we started. So we have that operation here, supply async, which runs on a common pool. But now we start running into another diff difficult situation. So let's go for CF1, then apply, and keep doing something with that thing out there. Let's not do much, then apply, then apply. Not doing much, and let's call then accept join. And now you might be thinking, okay, so we are running the original on the for join pool, but we don't want that. We want to we want to have our own executor instance. So we provide it here at the end. That's the trick. And now we are running finally on the executor of our choice. But now. We do, we do, then apply, then apply, then apply, then apply. So the question goes, let's say, hypothetically, let's say this completes, let's say this completes very fast. Let's say before we even get to this call. And that original thread that completed the, the work is gone. What happens? Because imagine this, this let's say this, this waits, we wait here 100 milliseconds. Um, we, we try to see what thread is actually running here. Get name, so return i. And as expected, this will be the same thread that executed the previous stage, right? Because it makes sense to continue. But now, imagine there is no delay here. And this completes immediately. So the thread is gone. So what do we do? Where does it get executed? Well, it needs to either pull the thread sometime magically from the thread pool um, or do something else. What do you think the answer is? What would you expect it to behave in such case? If you imagine you are designing Comptable Future, what would you do? Hmm? Get one from the thread pool. Okay, that's that sounds reasonable. So uh, if you'd like to, but the problem to uh, just to make sure that everyone hears in the recording, the idea was to grab it from a thread pool. But the problem is there is no connection. There is no connection between the thread pool that completed the first one and the second one. You might not have access to it. Okay, so let's see. It might it probably won't work in the first try. We're going to try a few times to see what's going on. 
Oh, we were very lucky. It happened the first one. So look, um, that method, so there was no thread to execute it. So instead of executing the thread pool, we use the main thread for that, which is the thread color thread effectively. The thread executing the main method. So um, let me make, put it straight for you. We called, we created a future with some uh, processing in there. We received the future. We scheduled more asynchronous processing to happen on top of that. And we received the future in return, which indicated asynchronous processing. But then it got executed on the thread that called it. So we got a future, but you still blocked on it. And you got blocking behavior, which is pretty much dangerous. Well, it's not dangerous if you do stuff like I do now, you know, integrating, integrating incrementation. But if suddenly you do some oper blocking operation that's going to last too long, you end up blocking and waiting for the operation because your thread is executing that, which is an interesting default choice. So that's why they introduced, the, they duplicated all the methods of the uh, computer future API so that um, you, got, you get this option to say async here. So that's why there are two methods. Then apply by default. Sometimes it's async, sometimes not. But if you want to guarantee that async is async, um, you need to add async. So let's run. But but wait, let's run it. Oh, but again, you swapped the then apply with then apply async, and you didn't provide your custom executor. So you are again on forging pool, polluting it with blocking operations, which is, as you can see, not nice. By the way, that forging pool is used by Project Loom as well. So, for example, if you pollute the forging pool with blocking operations, your Project Loom, your virtual threads, uh, well, they are virtual, but still they need to be executed by real threads, operating system threads. So, I'm not sure if they I'm not sure uh, if they handle that, but this could have potential potential issues. So, if you want to be fully sure, controlling the process, you need to always provide here executor of your choice, just like you would do with supply async. And now it's all fine, all correct, and executed in the same thread pool the way we expected. So again, this can, as you can see, this can be fixed, but I think the default choices are um, questionable. And that was actually the main one of the main points I wanted to show you today and fixes. But there is just one last cherry on top of the API. And it's called apply to either method. So we get rid of that. And we go new computable future. Uh, with integer, the second one. Um, and we do CF1, apply to either, CF2. And now we get to provide a lambda that should be applied to either of them. And as you can imagine, that returns another computable future that we can, let's call it the result, uh, join and print out the value. So um, there are no values inside, so you can expect it to just block forever. So let's complete those value futures with some values. So CF1 complete uh, with one and CF2 complete with two. So you would probably expect the, yep, yeah, is the first one, but it could be a second one. You know, the contract doesn't specify which one it needs to be. It's any of them. So if you expect it to apply something to any of them, well, you got that. So as you can imagine, this also has implications if there are some, there's some exceptional com uh, completion. So if we complete the second one with an exception, well, luckily you still get one, right? That's the way you would expect it to be because, well, there were two operations, one failed. So we always get the first one, right? That's how you would, yeah. Sounds good. Probably, probably, but again, we'll see. Without actual timings in here, you don't know what's going to happen. Probably the same CPU that you can say that how you get every single time. You need manual timings. Okay, um, so let's do, um, let's replace, let's make the first one 
to complete exceptionally and second one complete with the value two. How would you expect this to behave? Same way. The same way, right? Because you, well, you there's one completed exceptionally and second one completed with value two. So let's see what happens. Okay, there is an exception. Um, that's the way it works. So if the first one that completes exceptionally, it propagates the exception further and it never, and the second one, you never get to the, although, although you've had the right value all the time, you never get to it because it's the first exception in the chain that drives the exception flow and propagation for the, for the whole chain. Okay. And that's all I've wanted to show you today. I hope you learned some interesting stuff. Uh, that we still do have quite some time for Q&A and questions. So if you want to, we can go and explore some other aspects of Condor Future. So I hope you learned something. Thank you and see you hopefully soon. Uh, are we recording this? Sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, just something you might want to say. A couple of times you said that the future has behavior. Obviously, the future is an interface. So you mean presumably the default implementation future, which is supplied by the executor side. Yeah, that's true. The same with, oh, by the way, comfortable future itself. It's also in part. It's an implementation of a completion stage interface. So we've been speaking. Yes about defaults. So by the future is an interface and competence states an interface. And we've been speaking those about those default ones. Just what you put that on the <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you. So no well, so let's go and eat something and I don't buy it. You can ask me questions then. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Very much. It was nice, really nice. Who designed it though? Who is designing it though? Uh, smart people. Yeah. Yeah. I think I admire. Now the business.